5 is where we're at. Romans chapter number 5. We're going to go back in verse 1 and 2 again this morning. Um, just kind of to uh, uh, lay in some things here that we didn't have an opportunity to last time. Uh, mainly because in these first two verses, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And again, we uh, introduced these verses last time, and uh, in this, for the sake of not being here for the next five years in two verses, uh, I just wanted to touch on some things because what's going to happen here now is as we begin to move forward, we begin to build some things into our inner man here that are going to come to play in chapters 6, 7, and 8. And what's going to happen here is Paul is going to give us the details in chapter 5 about our peace, because we had that first benefit, peace with God, verse 1. Then the second benefit, we're going to have the access, is that you guys clicking or is it me? Somebody's chiming. Okay. Okay. Romans 5. So what we're going to do here is we're, we're going to lay in some information. We're going to lay in some uh, building blocks, if you will, some foundational cornerstones. As we move now on into 5, get the details, and then we get into 6, 7, and 8, we are going to need to have this in our understanding. Uh, the thing, the, one of the main reasons for going a little slower in these first chapters is because, quite honestly, after chapter 5 and the eternal security and the peace and the access and the hope is all laid out for us, Paul, he, astir, verse 1, therefore being justified, there is an assumption by Paul that, you're, that you believe what God, you believe the claim of God about his son and now about who you are in his son. I had a guy one time tell me, well, do you know that 99% of Paul's epistles are about your walk and your life and only a little bit, only five chapters about your justification? And I said, yeah, how many times did he have to tell you how to get saved? I mean, come on, he doesn't have to. Now, to get you to live the right kind of life, you're, we're all a bunch of knuckleheads and thick-headed, and you know, so he's got to go over that several times with you. But to the issue of justification, so there's going to be things here. Look over at Ephesians two. Just I'll give you an illustration of this. Ephesians two. Ephesians two, and verse number four. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Do you see how he just says that? That encapsulates the whole first five chapters of Romans in one verse. But in Ephesians, he doesn't go into great detail about his great love for us. Where, where, where do we see his great love for us? Romans 5, 8. But God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. There's his great love. We're the children of wrath back up in the passage in the preceding verses. And Paul, he's assuming, he's making an assumption that you have in your understanding clearly minted, cemented, confirmed the first five chapters of Romans. He will not go over it again. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians um, actually, you know, make it. Second Thessalonians. Make it Second Thessalonians. Make it Second Thessalonians two, and look at verse fourteen. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. The, one of the first books he writes, and he makes the assumption that you understand what? Our gospel. See that? He doesn't, there isn't a, okay, our gospel, which is blah, 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 blah. No, he, there's an assumption here. So go back to Romans 5. And so that's kind of why we're, this is lesson 44. Spending some time here. Now we'll pick up in 6, 7, and 8, I hope. We'll pick up in 9, 10, and 11, I hope. <laughs> you know, great plans. You know, it's like the, the old saying, the, 
the the war plan is good on paper till the first gun till the first bullet flies and then it goes out the door you know and that's what that's the, my plan is to pick up some speed here so go back to Romans 5 because when we go down through this information uh, again Paul works in threes and there's a tr there's a there's a there's a three here peace access and hope there's another three in 1 Corinthians 13 faith hope and charity okay there's actually a, a, going to be an issue we'll see when we get down into verse 5 about the love of God, and there's the charity issue. But these items, these un, this understanding needs to be cemented into our thinking because he's literally going to begin to build doctrine. Now, when we get into 6, 7, and 8 about our walk and our sanctification, we're going to get the details about that. And then we get over into 12 to 16, how to go live life out there as who we are as believers, we'll get those details. And then he comes in in Ephesians and he says, okay, you got your four corners in. Now let's build some more on top of that. Then he comes in Thessalonians, let's build some on that. And then in Timothy, he goes in Titus, he goes, let's put a roof over the house now. You know, you don't, I, we were going down the road the other day and I saw, two, uh, I saw a piece of a house go by and then another piece go by. Well, that, he's not building a house like that. He builds a house, lay in the foundation, let's put the walls up. So as we begin to build this superstructure in your inner man, this edifice of sound doctrine, this information here is, I don't want to just run through it because we can run through it for run through sake, okay? Verse number one, therefore being justified by faith, we have, and again, these this three benefits of justification, all three, all of these components here are dealing with our standing, our position in Christ. He says we have peace with God. Now, again, I know we looked at some of this last time. That's a wonderful thing. We're all good. We can never offend the justice of God again. We have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this is going to be a possession, not a process. All of this is going to be, all of, all of these benefits lie in a person, not in a process like the law, not in, not in covenant relationships like the law in Israel and so forth, but in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his propitiatorial act we've learned about in Romans 3. That's why we spent three weeks on that issue about propitiation, because it's going to become the bedrock when he tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, I've laid the foundation, and the foundation is Jesus Christ, this is what he's talking about. He's not talking about his earthly ministry. He's talking about who he is. We have peace, verse 2, by whom also, I love that, also, we have access into this, uh, by faith, into this grace wherein we stand. And number three, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. All of the benefits. So we're going to build here. The first block that we're going to build on is going to be the issue of peace. Then we're going to build on the issue of access. And then we're going to build on the issue of hope. And as we begin to build, and this build gets this into our inner man, we begin to le learn that because we have, we possess, okay? Th and that's the wonderful thing. We have. Now, if you look down at verse number 9, we'll get down there in a couple weeks. <laughs> he says, what? Much more. Now we're going to have some much more stuff. So we got our benefit package laid out here in front of us, our eternal, eternal security package, and it's a we have, because we have peace with God, now we can build in an access, and then upon that access we're going to build a rejoice and hope of the glory of God. We then develop a, an eternal viewpoint, an eternal perspective. And that's what the rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And what becomes the key component in our Christian life, I hate that terminology, but that's what it is. Because of 
the issue of who we are. This is all about our standing. And the key center of our Christian life is literally to be living our lives with the rapture in view. That's how we're supposed to be living our lives. What are, that's the hope of the glory of God. So when we delve into these here, all three deal with our standing. Now, what we're going to do in chapter 5 is we're going to get the details about our peace with God. Then in chapter 6, 7, and 8, we're going to get the details about our access and our hope. And we begin to lay in these details here, and we begin to see that because we possess His righteousness, therefore being justified. He says, I'm giving you my righteousness, and then I'm going to take you, and I'm going to put you on display out there. So when you think about peace with God, His righteousness is our, his righteousness is our righteousness. I love that. And you know what? That's the only way we can stand before the judgment seat, the judgment of God, if you will, not judgment seat, but the judgment of God, is to stand in His righteousness. When He says we have peace with God, we understand there that the penalty of sin has been completely this one, penalty. Penalty of sin has been completely de been dealt with. No, you and I can never, 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 ever, ever, ever again offend God. You know that? That's fantastic. Now, we're, we're going to do things in our lives that will offend him, but never offend his justice again. See, that we, we get over there in 6, 7, and 8, and he'll talk about <laughs> your standing. We're talking about your standing, then he's going to talk about your state, your life, the de de daily details of life. And the thing is, is that we do things daily, that will and do offend God, but we can never re-offend His justice. It's been satisfied. That justice, that, that, that justice bar that says you have to have perfect righteousness, we've got it. And then that's 2 Corinthians 5.21, where he who knew no sin was made sin, right? That he might, what? Make us His right righteous. That we would be made righteous. So we come over to chapter 6 of Romans. So we are to work toward, we're to stand and relax in that peace with God. <laughs> you know, isn't it wonderful when you know you have peace with someone and you have peace? You're no longer in turmoil. You're not under the gun. You can just relax. Because we're going to be looking for, we're working towards that issue of the power of sin being dealt with. Notice 6.1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid. So clearly, the attitude of God about you and I being under the power of sin, what's he say? God forbid, you're no longer under the power of sin. I have dealt with it, and I have set you free from it. So his righteousness, he gives us his righteousness so that we can have everything. And that we can come and we can stand in who we are in Him. And we can then go and live our lives as living them unto Him. That's why He says 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constrain you, because we thus judge that if one died for all and all were dead, that we would... Oh, 2 Corinthians 5, sorry. 
Verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see, he's done something in us so that he can do something through us. And that's what life is really all about, is coming along and saying, you know what, I have peace with God, I've been liberated, I can never do something that's going to put me back under the judgment bar of his justice. I've been set free, so then I can now come over here and put on display his life. Galatians 2.20. You follow that? So the peace with God here is very critical. Come back to chapter 5. And what's really so wonderful about it is we didn't do anything to gain our standing, you know? <laughs> we, we, didn't have to, we didn't have to do anything to gain peace with God. Remember the courtroom, first four chapters, first three chapters, guilty, 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 guilty. And then he says, but here's a deal that I've worked out with my son, and he's going to take your judgment. And all you have to do is, by faith, believing. Now, so since, because we didn't have anything to do with gaining the peace with God, now I can come along because I possess it. I have peace. Now I can go out there and put it on display. And, and honestly, that's the ultimate purpose. And that is that issue of understanding the penalty of sin has been dealt with, the power of sin has been dealt with, and then ultimately one day the presence of sin will go away, will be dealt with. There's our hope. That brings in that ultimate purpose which is that the presence of sin be dealt with once for all. That's the rejoice and hope of the glory of God. Now, how does God eliminate the presence of sin? How does He do that? The only, sin only succumbs to one thing. For the wages of sin is death. The only way that God can ultimately do away with sin is by death. Sin only yields to death. So then what, do, what, do we, what happens? We die, don't we? But then what do we, what do we know that we have? Resurrection life. See, that's what we're going to learn in chapters, chapter 8. As hey, we got things working in our favor here. <laughs> It's all for our advantage. So when you come back here, 5.1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we started in 1.18 with the wrath of God revealed against us, right? We're here in chapter 5. We find out there in verse 7 that we're without strength, we're ungodly, we're sinners, we're enemies. We're a worthless case, aren't we? Come over to Ephesians 2. Come back. Well, we were there a minute ago, but this is in a different light. Ephesians 2. You see, folks, the peace with God is not just something to glance over. It's something that you have to grasp. Again, we're going to get more details about the issue of peace as we go down through Romans 5. But just notice uh, who you are now, and but who you were back then. Uh, Ephesians 2.1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Notice you were dead. You were. Past tense. It's, this is your condition in the past. Wherein in time past, we'll see, there you go. You walked according to the course of this world. You ever notice sometimes, in, well, maybe you don't, but I do. You're teaching, you start talking about it, you read the next verse, it just says what you just said. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just funny. That I was like, wait a minute, I just said that, but the verse said it, so we'll let the verse say it, okay? Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, 
The spirit that now worketh in the children of what? Disobedience. Who were you? Who were you? Child of disobedience, weren't you? Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of flesh and of the mind, and were, notice the next two words, by nature. This is who you were. Here's your nature. The children of wrath, even as others. Well, it's real clear who you were, isn't it? You were the children of disobedience. You're the children of wrath. But that thing is by nature. See, this is just who you were. Then verse 4, Ephesians 2, 4, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Come over to chapter 4 of Ephesians. Chapter 4. You see, folks, you and I, we start in a dis, disadvantage. But 5.1, therefore being justified, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Now we're at an advantage. See, Ephesians 4.17, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves on, over unto lasciviousness to work all cleanliness with greediness. Notice the condition of the Gentile. Now, Paul in Ephesians 4, he's talking to believers who have decided that, good, I'm saved, I'm secure, and I'm in, but I'm just going to go live any way I want to live, see? And Paul says, no, 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 you misunderstood the rest of chapter 5 and all of 6, 7, and 8 <laughs> of Romans. You're missing the boat here, see? And he's warning you, don't do that. Go back. Again, that's why I started with saying this stuff, I just don't want to skip through Romans 5 because we can. And, you know, I know the room here is like, yeah, we're grounded, we're good, we're blah, blah. But it's like, no, you can't just skip through it. Chapter 5 of Ephesians. Verse 6, by, by the way, in, in 4 there, in verse 18, being alienated from the life of God. If you're alienated, you know what you don't have? Peace. You're at odds. You're alienated. Chapter 5, verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the Wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The wrath was, was ours, and rightfully so, because of who we were. But now what do we have? We have peace. We come back to Romans 5. <clears throat> Romans 5. We have peace. If you look down at verse number 10, Romans 5, 10. For if when we were, I love that, when we were enemies. Isn't that interesting? Enemies. You know what we used to be? Enemy. But no longer because we are justified. So what are we? Are we? We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. See how death is in there dealing with the issue of sin? Much more, uh-oh, there's another much more. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Reconciled. I love that word. We, it comes along and it, and, it, and it takes two people who are at odds. And it restores the relationship. It doesn't, it, it fixes the gulf in between them. And the gulf between us and God was a big cavern, a little bigger than the Grand Canyon, okay, called sin. And God said, I'll fix it. Let me fix it. You can't fix it. I have to fix it. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to cost my son his life. People say, oh, you guys understand right division, dispensation, you know, a cheap grace. Because you, all you have to do is believe. And, and when we say believe in Christ and that, and that alone, see, they think that's easy. It's easy. B 
because it you're not having to do anything. See, they got a religious mind of, I got to do something. I got to walk the aisle, do this, do that. This is not cheap. It was very expensive. It cost the Savior his life. It cost the Son his life. And you know what? Paul has proven the case. Chapter 1 to 4, the courtroom, he did it all legally. He did it all just and the justified. He did it right. And he says, I have to fix it. You can't fix it. By the way, no, much more be much more being reconciled. Man, that's wonderful in that verse. That's our future. You're a reconciled child. That's who you are. You possess it. So then back up in verse 2, he says, by whom also. So not only do we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, now through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also, what do we have? Access, again, by faith. This isn't something Dad used to say, the Lord doesn't bore a hole in your head and dump it all in. you got to study. That's why 2 Timothy 2.15 says study. The Lord, the Lord comes in, the Father comes in and says, because of my son's work, and you're by faith believing in the shed blood of my son, which Romans 3, we've been through it, and it's the law of faith, no boasting, no works, I'm going to unlock the door into this grace wherein you stand. I'm going to provide the pathway. I'm going to come along and I'm going to open that door so you can come in now and enjoy and access and enjoy your standing, who you are in Christ. Come in and enjoy, learn who He is, His character, His attributes, who the Godhead is. Why? Because we're going to go rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, that third step out there. And what do we do, Ephesians 2, 7? What does He do with you and I in the ages to come? He manifests, He puts on display the exceeding riches of His grace. Well, if, you don't, if you're not able to get in the building to learn His grace and what it is and what it's all about, when he goes and plops you up in the heavenly places out there, you're going to be a nightlight rather than the sun in the sky display. Again, you got, I say that because in my mind, we've, already, we've been looking at heaven over the summer, and that, that thing there in, in Matthew 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he, he, it shines inward, outward. That's what we're going to be. We're not going to be a moon, you know, a moon reflects the sunlight. We're going to be as the sun, out, coming out of us, inside of us, outwards. Now, come over to Romans 8, 15. Romans 8. This issue about our access and about our peace. Look at Romans 8. And again, remember where you were, but where you're at now. Romans 8, 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Isn't that interesting? We haven't received again the bondage of, the spirit of bondage again to what? what? If you have peace with God, what do you fear? You should never fear anything. There should be no fear. But yet, what do we do? We put ourselves back under a spirit of bondage to what? To fear, don't we? If you understand that, and this again, chapter 5, that you will never lose our standing. Then when we're over in 6, 7, and 8, living our, learning how to live in our state, our status, our daily lives, what do we begin to do in our daily lives? We begin to put ourselves under some bondage, don't we? That, oh no, if I mess up, I got to run over here and beg for forgiveness. If I mess up, you know, 
But rather what you learn in Romans 6 is, is when you mess up, you got peace. It's all taken care of. You've been freed. F-R-E-E-D, that word is in Romans 6, 6 and 7. You've been crucified. That old stuff's gone. So the only reason why, 6.14, you're not under law, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Why doesn't sin have dominion over you? You're not under the law, you're under what? Grace. See that? So what happens? In our daily lives, what do we do? We come over there, and then rather than enjoy the peace we have, we run right back underneath a bondage scenario, and now what do we have? Fear. Paul's like, you knuckleheads, you ain't getting it. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Think about that. We now can cry, Abba, Father. We can call the judge, Romans 1, 2, and 3, Dad. We now call the judge, the one that was laying down the guilty verdict, we call him Father now. The cry of the beloved one. That's where we're at. Come on, uh, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are fully functioning sons. Notice this carefully. The Spirit itself beareth witness with the Spirit. The sole purpose of the Holy Spirit is to come along and to equip us to enjoy who we are as the children of God. And then to take that understanding of who we are and then go put it on display in life. That's his sole purpose. Now, he uses the Word of God. He's got things like that. But that's his passion. Everybody says, where's your passion? (laughs) You're very passionate about that. Well, here's the Spirit's passion. Let's get you to get out of worrying about something you can't, you you had no control over, but just, he says, you have it. Peace. You have access. Verse 17, And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. You're my son now, the Father says. So you know what? I got something for you. I've got an heir. For, you're an heir, and you're a joint heir with Christ. I've got something for you, the hope of the glory of God. I've got something for you. So we have peace, back in chapter 5 now, verse 1. We have peace. We're reconciled. Uh, that verse over there in verse 11 He says, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. You see, I love that word atonement. What a great word. Do you see at one meant? Where were we? We were his enemies, verse 10. We were reconciled, or had our, our relationship, our status changed, and now we're at one with the Godhead. At one meant. People always Always get in there and go, ah, there should be reconciled and not at one, at atonement. No, it should be atonement. <laughs> Your King James Bible translators understood what was going on. By the way, that Greek word that's recon- translated reconciled, guess what it can also be translated as? Atonement. Oh, amazing, isn't it? Just worked that way. But they understood what Paul was dealing with and talking about here. Now, so, verse 2, by whom also we have. Something we didn't have before, now what do we got? We got it now, don't we? We have access, and we have access into something that we didn't have access before. Come over to Ephesians 2, back to Ephesians 2, and verse number 11. Again, in thinking of this, it's like, okay, this is what we were, and this is what we are now. Ephesians 2, verse 11 and 12. We have access. We have a pathway. We have a door that just opened. Lay just came in. The door opened. He can come in. He can get into the room. You and I can now get into this, wherein uh, we have access by faith into this grace. 
He's introducing something new now. Ephesians 2.11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were, what? Without. Isn't that interesting? Where were you back over there? You were without. As a sinner, guess what you were? Without Christ, weren't you? (laughs) I know this is dispensationally, but think about you as a sinner. Guess what? You're in the same boat. You're without Christ. Now he says, being alienated, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having what? No hope. And without God in the world. Our access is fixed in a person. Go back there to Romans 5, verse 2. By the way, if you look at, if you're still in Ephesians 2, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus. Ye who sometimes are far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. There's the person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, verse number 2 again. By whom, by whom, Romans 5, 2, we have, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We have, our access is fixed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not fixed in a covenant relationship like Israel had. It is not fixed in a relationship of the law. Down in Ephesians 2, for time's sake, we didn't read down there, he's broken down the middle wall of partition. He's he's, uh, taken the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and blotted them out. So our relationship now is with a person... Okay, but also verse 2 says, what else? Also, we have access by faith into this what? Into this grace. So not only do we have the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, but now we got this thing called grace. (laughs) And now we've got something that's going to come along now and bolster up, fortify. Our access, our past, no access, no covenant, no without Christ, without God, without any hope. But now, in Christ, what do we have? We have peace and we have what? Access. We have a pathway to enjoy. Again, you come into the room. When you came to understand the word rightly divided, you understand right division, Dad's little track back there, the key to understanding the Bible. What did it do? Right division isn't the end of it. It's just the mechanism to do what? Open the door. So you can go in and have what? Access to uh, a rightful understanding of the Word of God. That's what's going on here. You trust by faith. Calvary, the the propitiatory act of the Lord Jesus Christ, activities. And you know what he does? He rolls out the red carpet. The bands are playing. The paparazzis are there taking your picture. And he says, come on in. Here's who you are. But not just who you are. Here's this grace wherein ye stand. Here's a program of information designed specifically for you. That's why when you read when Paul says, the faith, you've got to kind of pay attention to what he's talking about. He's usually talking about the message and the ministry. Same with the grace. In Galatians 2, when they give Paul and them the right hand of fellowship, they perceive the grace that he received. He's not talking about that God had mercy on him and didn't kill him. He's talking about the message. Now we have access into all that the Father is doing. And we can re- relax in it. Come over to chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 19. Chapter six, nineteen. Again, our past. I speak after the manner of men, 
because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto... Look, unto iniquity. Not just iniquity, but iniquity unto iniquity. Isn't that the, you, do you know that in your, in your old man, in your flesh, you strived to become servants of iniquity unto iniquity? You have a passion for that. Somebody comes along and gives you the gospel, and he says, just as you had that passion for living in your old stinking rotten flesh, verse 20, for when we were the servants, I'm sorry, the end of verse 19, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Just as you were full of of gusto zeal for that old stuff have the same zeal for who you are in christ that's fantastic verse 20 for when we were the servants of sins you were free from righteousness you see that we were willingly folks i hope you understand as as a sinner when in your past before calvary you willingly obeyed that flesh you willfully went and did what it wanted to be done. No, it didn't. I was doing what I wanted to do. No, you were doing what your old sin nature wanted to be done. That's what you're doing. And you did it with gusto. You did it with he with the most toys at the end wins attitude. Boom. And you know what Paul says? Now that you're in Christ, have that same gusto for having peace with God, just relaxing in who you are in Christ. By faith into this grace wherein we stand. Again, verse 14 here, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. The access is based upon a person, and it's based upon the program of grace. 6.22, but now... I love that. He's going to stick you just when you're like, okay, you know, I got you, Paul. going to gig you again. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruits unto holiness and, and the end everlasting life. But now, therefore being, because you are who you are now in Christ, you're free from sin. Now go rest on it. Rest in who we are. So peace, access, peace. We are saved by grace through faith, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Access. We'll learn as we get into chapter 6 and 7 in this access into this grace wherein we stand, we'll learn that we are sanctified by grace. We're going to go and live our lives as who we are in Christ because of the program called grace. And in that program, you know what he says? You're going to have two natures. You're going to have that old sin nature because what what deals with sin? Death. You see, when you got saved, he didn't kill you and bring you home to glory. He left you here on this wonderful place called earth. See, he le- why? Because he has the end of verse 2 and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He's got more to the story, doesn't he? He says, hey, the only thing that's going to deal with sin ultimately is death. So until then, you're going to live here on the earth, and I'm going to give you a job to and call you an ambassador. You're going to get out here, and you're going to be a witness to me in the earth out here. But your hope is the heavenly places. Your hope is the the rejoicing and the hope of the glory of God. And because of that, you need to understand that you just need to rest and relax in who I've made you and who I, what I've given to you, all grace, all sufficiency, all spiritual blessings. 
all completeness. I've given it all. I've fully equipped you completely to handle everything that comes your way in life and to do it in the new man. Not do it in your old. So what do you got to do? Bullinger said in his Two Natures of the Believer book, he says, your two natures are like dogs tied up on chains. And the dog you feed is going to be the dog that wins in the fight. Galatians 5 says that there's a war that happens. And the flesh is trying to get you to do stuff that the Spirit wants you to do, and he's trying to get you not to do it. And, and uh, Bullinger said it. He, he's like, man, you feed the flesh. That flesh is going to win at every turn. But if you're feeding that new guy, the new man, then guess what happens? You're good to go. All right? Now, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, how much hope do, you, do we have? I, yeah, I, I think about that. How much hope do you have? <laughs> Folks, I hope you know that in your time past, you were doomed to a life of eternal damnation in the lake of fire. As a sinner. That's where you were doomed to. Now, in Christ, now, in His grace, in this grace we stand, we're doomed to a life of everlasting life in the heavenly places, in the glory of God. I think I'll take the latter than the former. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay? And when you, what happens is, is... What he talks about here, about rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Come back to Romans 8 and look at verse 17 again. We didn't finish the verse a minute ago on purpose because I knew we were coming back to it. <laughs> That's why it's good to, have, to be the teacher. You know where the, everybody's going, right? Look at Romans 8, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. By the way, the heirs of God, Titus over there says that, that as an heir of God, you, you inherit eternal life. The joint heir with Christ. Well, what did, what did God the Father promise God the Son? Ephesians 1, verse 10. That he would be the head over all of the universe, the government. So if he's going to be the head over all of the government, uh, Colossians 2, 10 over this says, And you're complete in him who is the head of, over, the principalities and powers. If you're... On the joint heir, if you're my joint heir, what do you get? You get the same thing I get. Well, what's the Lord getting? The headship of the, of the universe, the government realm, right? Guess what we, we, we do? We participate in that that the Father is giving the Son. See that? We participate in that. So what does he say? If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified. What's that last word? Together. You see, we're going to be glorified together with Christ. He's the joint, we're joint heirs with him. What did the Father promise Christ? An inheritance in the saints. The Father gets. He looked at Christ and he says, I'm going to set you far above all principalities and powers. You're going to be the head over all of this stuff for the church, to the advantage of the church. You're going to be the cat's meow, the preeminent one. You're going to be the potentate, back over there Paul calls him. And he says, you're going to be it. And you know what I'm going to do with you, body? I'm going to put you right in there with him. And what he's getting, you're going to get. That's why the verse in Romans 5, 2 says, hope of the glory of God. It's not hope in the glory of God. It's the hope of the glory of God. We are participating in it as well, completely and totally. That's, that, that makes having peace look like Sunday school, kindergarten. That's fantastic because what does it tell you? It tells you that God not only saved you, but he has a program and a plan for you and I. And he says, I want you to put on display the peace and the access. I want you to go out there and put it out there for everybody to see. Come over to chapter 8. Chapter 8 of Romans. Chapter 8. <clears throat> Verse uh, verse 29, by whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Notice that verse. Conformed 
to the image of his son. What is the image of his son? Is it him coming lowly and meekly down the pathway on the back end of the baby donkey into, into Jerusalem and they're crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and all that? Matthew 21? No. What's the image of his son? The glorified, resurrected, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, far above all principality and power. That's who he's talking about. He's talking about Philippians 3. He's going to change our vile body and fashion it like his glorious body. Glory. He's talking about when he walks on the, when he comes down after the resurrection and he walks with the f- people and he goes in there to Thomas and he says, feel me, touch me, here I am. And he walks through the walls and he does all this wonderful, like, oh my goodness, look at him. Paul says, I wanted you to understand to be conformed to him. That's why he says in Philippians, he over there goes, I want to know him more and more, and I want to be in the power of his resurrection. Paul says, man, we're not doomed for this life. We're doomed for glory, for the heavenly places. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, great. Woo-hoo. Come on. No, man, that is so fantastic. Come over to 1 Corinthians 2. You see, oh, by the way, stay in Romans 8. We didn't finish reading the verse. <laughs> verse 30, that's the verse I was after. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom, by the way, predestinate, you know, great term to get you in a Bible battle real quick. But what does that word mean? It tells you right in the word. Destinate, pre. Your destiny has been what? Predetermined. What's been your predest- What's been predetermined about your destiny? That you're going to be conformed to the image of his dear son. Woo. There's resurrection. There's life. There's glory. So then you've got to get in there and figure out what he gave his son. There's your joint heirship. There's, there's your sonship. Use a word everybody likes to use. Verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate them, he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. By the way, that word called, Mark over there defines that word call as chosen. It runs in the realm of the word elect. Election has nothing to do with salvation. It always has to do with service. Never forget that. If you believe that election has to do with salvation, you made the Lord Jesus Christ a sinner, a sinful man who needed to be saved himself, Isaiah says. When Isaiah over there looks in a a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ coming, and he says, Behold, mine elect, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in the subsequent verse, guess what? If you say election has to do with salvation, you just made the Lord a sinner. So guess what? He cannot be your Savior because he's a sinner. Ooh, room got quiet. Got to think some of this through. Don't just hiccup to to the religious... Yuckety yucks out there. Whom he did call, he did them he also what? Justified. Notice, by the way, it's past tense. We're in Romans 8. It's a done deal, isn't it? Justified. Predestinated, called, justified. It's all done. And then he says, whom he justified them, he also what? Glorified. When we come down through this passage, come over to 1 Corinthians 2. We'll look at and we'll see the fact is is that you and I can live our lives right now in time as if we are already seated together in the heavenly places. And the people, the, the person that holds that back in your life from being a reality is you. Because you want to live in squalor in your suffering and in your moaning and in your pig pen of your life. Instead of standing up and saying, you know, this is who I am in Christ, and I'm going to stand in it, and I'm going to get going. That verse over there we, we looked at a couple weeks ago, with, as, as God has seen it, it's already done. But you and I, we trudge through it. It ain't done in our mind, but in his mind, it's done. All right, 1 Corinthians 2, you found that passage now. I didn't mean to preach at you. We're supposed to be learning and studying here. Verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. <clears throat> Paul wants to take the Corinthians on in their edification process, but he can't do it. 
Why? Chapter 3, verse 1, what are they? They're carnal even as on the babes in Christ. They're not growing up. They're staying, they're wallowing in their lifestyle, they're wallowing in, their, in, in who they used to be instead of moving on. He says, such were some of you, but you, ye are washed, sanctified, reconciled, all this stuff, justified, all this stuff. And, and they're, not, they're not catching it. They're not, they're, they stayed in Romans 1 to 5. They're not in 6, 7, and 8 yet. They're not moving on. They're not growing. So he says, I can't bring you to maturity. Verse 6 there, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, mature, growing up. We can't do this. Paul wants to. I want to give you the next step, but you guys aren't ready. Paul's never going to violate the ministry of the Holy Spirit by giving people more than, well, they putting, giving people stuff that they could never handle. He says, you got to get this first. By the, just by the way, sorry, you look at verse 2 of chapter 3. See how he says, I have fed you with what? Milk. See that? And not with meat. Now come back to chapter 2. In verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do you know what Paul calls milk is 2-2? Two, two. He says the only thing I can get deal with you guys on level-wise here is the issue of the gospel, is the issue of Romans 1-5. to five. I can't give you the meat, which is 6, 7, and 8. You're struggling with the gospel. Why? Well, there's chapter 1's just told you there's divisions among them. Some are following Paul, some are following Peter, some are following the Lord, some are just following whoever walked through the back door. There's those divisions. He's like, man, I'd love to move you on. Verse 2 7. I'd, I got to move on. <laughs> 2 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto. Now, notice those last two words very carefully. Whose glory? Our glory. Isn't that interesting? Not His glory. Not God's glory. Not the Father's glory. Not the Son's glory. But whose glory? Our glory. That's wonderful. God says, we are to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is our glory. It's the glory that we're going to share together, come back to Romans 5, with the Lord Jesus Christ with the one who shed his blood for us. And God says, rest, relax in that. I've taken care of everything. Take the advantage and rejoice in it. Because you know what's going to happen? 5-3, life's going to reach up and smack you upside the head. Now religion says, oh, if you're in Christ, life's going to be wonderful. If you give $100 in the thing, we'll get you back right at 10%. And then that hit, they get the old shine going, don't they? No. What's going to happen? Verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. Wait a second. I'm up here in cloud nine, man. Peace and, and access and hope. And then you tell me i got to go glory in tribulation also? You know what we're going to learn as we move now into three next time? Is we have been given, not we have, because of what we have in these three areas, the benefits of justification, we now have a divine perspective on what life is really all about. And when the tribulations come up, the next word also Next word, knowing. We're able to comprehend. We're able to understand. We're able to know that tribulation works with patience, patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Do you know that that's the first time in Romans that you find out that the Holy Ghost has been given to you? is in that verse right there, and it's in connection to you understanding the details of life and having the love of God shed abroad in your hearts, that you begin to have a divine viewpoint on life, as lousy as it can get or as high as it can get. See, when we're up in the clouds, 
on the mountaintops, we sometimes forget to say, thank you, Lord. We get down in the valleys and we're like, why, Lord? What did I do to you? Help me out here. And he says, I didn't do nothing to you. I'm the same God up as you are down. <laughs> You're the one down there, dummy, not me. You could have stayed up here. <laughs> anyway, we'll get into all that next time. All of that's based on what we have, our access, our peace. By the way, there's another three, faith, hope, and charity. And you know what those begin to flow out of is that issue of access. And we'll see that when we get over uh, in, uh, in, in, in Romans 6, okay? All right. I hope you catch. This stuff isn't just fly-by verses. Therefore, being justified, and we skip down to tribulation, work with pay, because that's where everybody's at. Don't fly over these verses. These first two verses, these are phenomenal verses. And by the way, we just scrape in the surface because we need to get on. <laughs> we need to move on a little bit, okay? All right. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for everything that we have in your Son, for the peace, for the access, and for the hope of the future glory that we're to reign and to have in you. And Lord, I just pray that we'll take this to heart apply it to our lives, and then go live our lives to put on display you for all men to see. In your name we pray. Amen.